different things. And uh, a year ago, uh, he called me and asked me if I would write songs for, or, or write, write the cartoons, write the songs and storyboard them for, for uh, Tom and Jerry. And uh, at the time I was just too busy to do it, but uh, he called me back in July of last year and he said, and I already said you're busy, but I'm gonna ask you again, you wanna do it? Well, now I've been working on a bunch of stuff with Greg and we're just having so much fun. So immediately I said, yes, let's do it. So that's how it happened. Right on. What is, uh, I'm led to believe your process is a little unique that you work together. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how you combine your efforts to bring the right music to the to the screen? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I hate to do all the talking, no, but, I, but I get involved in the process. Well, of yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he's he's sort of the head of the whole thing, which right kind of makes it. You know, but yeah, the, well, I can start. But anyway, the the, the way these are different is that the uh, you know normal animation. Um, the story is written and the storyboards and it's all sent off to the, you know, animation company and the animation is done and they send it back to the music people who then write music to the animation. So this was, since they wanted musicals, this is, this is kind of the opposite. So it's kind of explain the workflow. Right. So I uh, write a bunch of premises for cartoons and I submit them to the story supervisor. He tosses the ones that he knows we've already done a cartoon like that we know that the uh, management would never go for that cartoon and then out of the ones that are left he sends them over to warner brothers and and they pick which ones they want me to go forward with so then i i write uh an outline and uh i'll talk with greg and we'll decide well what should this song be like uh you know, stylistically. Um, and then once we settle on that, uh, we already know that the cartoons are going to be three minutes long. So that tells us at whatever tempo we pick, that's how many bars of music we've got to work with. And uh, so I incorporate the lyrics into the outline of, of the cartoon. And I break the, the action of the cartoon down very, very um, uh, densely. And uh, so at, at the point that I've got the most of the lyrics written, I usually have a sense of what the song goes like. So I may have some of the song already written and turn it over to Greg to start uh, uh, finishing that and, and start the process of orchestrating and arranging. Um, uh, and then uh, we have a rough version of the song that I can put into um, Premiere and I can start taking my storyboards and adding them into the timeline and syncing my drawings up to the music. So then this is a process that takes a couple of weeks and during that time, Greg and I will be constantly working back and forth. I'll, when, when he's got some of the story completed, he'll share it with me and I'll go, oh, that's a great thing. I'm going to change the storyboards to reflect that what you're doing there with the, the arrangement. And sometimes he'll look at the boards and go, oh, I should do such and such with the, with the orchestration. So, and we go back and forth with that and it, and it uh, develops and evolves over over uh, about two weeks or two and a half weeks. And at the end of it, the music is completed. Uh, we've, we've brought in singers and they, they've completed the, the vocals. We do a, 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 a mastering of the, of the music and send that out to Warner Brothers as a, as a finished animatic. So all the, the storyboard panels have been rough time to the music and it goes up, off to, to uh, Warner Brothers where they can tinker with it or, or leave it as, as is if they like it the way it is. Are they, are they animating from your um, blue lines or storyboards or, or is Oh, Warner absolutely. Brother... Yeah. yeah, it sounds like you really know a lot about animation process. And so I'm probably not uh, telling you anything that, that you don't already know that in television animation, 
what uh, story panels you deliver to to the animation process pretty much ends up on the screen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in fact, if you want, Greg can send you a link to uh, one of the animatics. Now, I can share this with you because this one Warner Brothers didn't actually make, uh, but it was uh, it was one that I submitted and they passed on. But we both thought it was just such a, a strong cartoon that I I went ahead and and uh, and uh, boarded it all out and and uh, so we uh, created this it's like a, a fake trailer for for if Tom and Jerry had ever been in a a, uh, a, a like a James Bond type of movie where Tom is the super spy and Jerry is the evil world dominating villain you get to switch settings a lot that implies there's a lot of uh, different styles of music, right? Um, Correct. Yes. So are you ever going as far back like some of the Looney Tunes with the uh, Barbara of Seville or the hair of, you know, uh, when Bugs Bunny did the opera one, do you ever get to do any opera um, well, episodes? Or is that something that in the future we're looking uh, at? Yeah, yeah. You, you were going to, you did pitch an opera one, I remember. Yeah. Okay? That one, I can't remember why, I think it was, I don't remember the reason, but yeah, we did go uh, in Torch Song. Uh, we did reach back to classical repertoire because the, the uh, plot unfolds to where Tom in a fantasy is, is uh, playing the piano in the lounge for his, for Toots, his love interest. And uh, so uh, it starts off, we wrote what was like a Torch Song in us. We wanted it to sound like it was a jazz standard that this Toots was just covering in the lounge. And so Tom's fantasizing he's playing. Well, one thing leads to another. His nemesis Butch pops into reality <laughs> and sort of takes over a little bit. And then they go back and forth to the dueling. And then one thing goes. So we uh, pulled and pulled from classical classical piano literature, like the Grieg, uh, you know, A minor, the some Chopin, Beethoven, just going back and forth. So we did pull from some of the classical piano literature uh, that way. So. Um, sort of that kept that was sort of in the classic vein of yeah of uh, of Tom and Jerry that way yeah we did pitch an, an opera uh, the some, there's a lot of different constraints and one of them is definitely budgetary mm -hmm. so uh, they look at they look at a, th a, a, a show and, and and also because this series of Tom and Jerry is supposed to be um, Piggybacking on the on the movie that came out, so they were they were quite specific about what sort of locations it was okay for Tom and Jerry to go to. Uh, but on the opera one, they were concerned that that we would it would take so many characters and and just so much animation and so many new sets that it would just be cost prohibitive to make. But uh, hey, maybe if they do another season, uh, Bernard Herman uh, famously scored uh, Psycho in black and white and used all the high ends and shrieking and or uh, violins and string instruments. How do you you guys use color to influence your music and inspire what, what we hear? Hmm. Um, I, well, I guess we're, we're mainly doing songs. So the song is kind of dictating the style. Well, as far as, far as color, uh, I guess on Torch Song, um, I did, it, there is some score at the beginning. And we just pretty much, it pretty much drew on classical Carl Starling, called Carl Starling's kind of uh, uh, orchest you know, orchestral stuff with, with woodwinds and things of that, of that nature. I think with what we're doing with many musicals, it's more of the, it's more of the song that kind of, the style of the song drives the episode. Like uh, we found a, he found a way to do a surfing, <laughs> a surfing <laughs> episode because the Jersey Shore is close enough to the hotel, I guess. And so, uh, then that was definitely 70s, right? Pretty much beach. 60s. Oh, 60s, yeah. 60s beach songs. So, you know, lots of B3 and uh, mm -hmm. guitars and that kind of thing. So that, so we just sort of copied that style. Is it, what What do you think comes first, the story or the song that you want to do? Like, as an example, oh. did you, do you have a, a, a surf song on the tip of your tongue and then you write out the surf? The, well, that the, 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 <laughs> yeah. uh, no, uh, Definitely, the the story comes first. Uh, the fact that uh, we know that the song has to be 
three minutes long within a couple of seconds. I think it can be as long as 304 and as short as you know 258 or something like that. Mm -hmm. That locks us into certain structures. Uh, we we knew approximately for for the surf song, if it's going to be an up tempo song, it should probably be somewhere around like fun, fun, fun by the Beach Boys, something that high energy and, and just really driving. Um, but then it is, uh, well, fortunately at the time, uh, I was in a band that was doing a lot of Beach Boys songs. So I was very familiar with the instrumentation, uh, the, the way they constructed their harmonies and and uh, so I got to draw on the five singers in, in the band to cover all the voices in, in, uh, in that episode. So we were, uh, so there were a lot of really just fortunate coincidences uh, as this thing progressed. And, and that was one of them to have this access to this array of really great singers. And Warner Brothers gave us, gave us pretty much carte blanche to use whoever we wanted to use, which and we, us going into this, we didn't we didn't really know that would be the case. We uh, we were my wife's a, a great singer. We had her sing a part of Toots, and uh, we had other friends come in. Um, and this was during COVID, so we couldn't really go to a studio. We were just bringing people into this my place, and uh, and they they loved they loved it all. So we're like, oh great! So <laughs> so we're just doing it all, doing all all of your singing and everything. You mentioned it. Uh piggybacks off of the movie is it happen after the movie does this does this story take place after the movie or are these stories kind of set in and out of the movie it doesn't specifically refer to the the a action of the movie at least in any of the ones we were involved in but that told us what are the dynamics the, the tom works in the the hotel trying to keep it rid of mice and and Jerry has moved in, and, and so so it's a, there. You you won't find anything in our cartoons that contradict what's in the movie, but uh, but we weren't, you know, we didn't have to. In fact, they, they wouldn't even let us see the movie before we started <laughs> before, <laughs> before we started on this. So, but we would we would get people. Oh no, it has you know it can't be like that because in the movie, oh, yeah, that it, doesn't happen. Right. The movie hadn't, hadn't been released, you know, at all. So. Uh, but it, it's still set in that same universe, if you will. Correct. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, as a kid, I used to watch Tom and Jerry a lot, every almost every day before school. That, that was just what was on TV as I was getting ready. Uh, but what, what did you guys watch when you were kids? What was your favorite cartoons? Uh, well, I diligently watched The Wonderful World of Disney um in hope that there might be a cartoon usually it was charlie the lonesome cougar or <laughs> right. something like that but every once in a great while there would be paul bunyan or or uh you know a goofy primer or or uh, some donald duck and chippendales and, and that stuff and uh usually when i was growing up there was some version of the bugs bunny show and i was a huge Bugs Bunny fan, and I loved all of those characters. Um, uh, so that it was, and and then of course the the Disney feature films would get one of those. I think they made like one every five years, approximately. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I I loved I loved all that stuff. Yeah, I, I, I always went to the theater to see those. Uh... The Ashman and uh, Lincoln uh, films, especially, but I, I watched Tom and Jerry uh, growing up, and uh, I also loved uh, Bugs Bunny and Roadrunner, Daffy Duck. Um, who else? Oh well, then you know Scooby Doo was on. Let's see what else. I don't know if these things were in syndication by then at all either, but I didn't, it didn't matter to me. So I, I watched my share. Saturday morning was pretty much my time to watch, you know, cartoons. So that's that's a bit of a dream come true, right? You you worked on the Looney Tunes show, and now Tom and Jerry, as um, yeah. you know, your shows that you watch as a kid, you finally get to produce and put your fingerprint on. What's that like? Put your stamp on these iconic characters. Um, yes, well, I can tell by your hat that you're a big Batman fan. So we'll get so you know, right there. <laughs> I uh, yeah, I. Uh, I thought I was going to be a Batman artist. That's what I wanted to do when I was a little kid. And Neil Adams was my favorite 
comic book artist, and he's still my favorite comic book artist. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and but um, uh, are uh, are you the same person who interviewed Burt Ward? Yes, that's uh, me. Yeah. Okay. Burt Ward used to have a music management company in the eighties, and he managed the band I was in for for a, a short period before, <laughs> right before he decided. I'm going to get back into acting. And then he just <laughs> closed up his company and went, went back into acting. <laughs> I, I can barely catch my breath right now. Breaking, Burt Ward was your manager in the 80s? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what was the name of that band? Uh, well, the what it was, uh, it was three people, myself, the bass player and the keyboard player from my band, and then the, the lead singer and the drummer from another band he liked. And uh, so the, the band that I was in was called Gallery. Um, but at the time, uh, he, he already had two acts that he personally managed. One was called Frankie and the Knockouts, and the other one was an East Coast band called Blotto. And uh, so, yeah, we had a, remember when they used to make little lacquer discs? Uh, we yeah. had one of those pressed and- uh, Of course. And we, thought, we thought we were off to the races, uh, but then uh, when he sent the record to his people on the East Coast, they hated it. So I think at that point he started to <laughs> <laughs> lose interest. He's, right. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> what, a, what, a great, what a great story. Yeah. Do you- <laughs> Did you uh, did you have a lot of interaction with him back then, back in the day, or was... uh, not a lot? Just uh, uh, the, the the way it worked out was uh, our the recording engineer that had recorded our music. He uh, he connected us up, and so um, it's hard to remember exactly. This is a lot of years ago. Uh, exactly how much interaction, but. Uh, I do remember he had a really amazing house uh, in Malibu with a waterfall in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. Um, what, a, well, what about, if you don't mind talking about that show a little bit, did you guys watch the, uh, the Batman show as a kid? As kids? Or, uh, yeah. As adults, or or, or what, what are your thoughts? Well, on okay. Uh, Bruce, Tim, uh, and I worked together on Tiny Toons, which was the first show that uh, Warner Brothers embarked on in the, in the new uh, era of Warner cartoons. And it was so successful, it kind of caught Warner Brothers flat-footed. So Bruce and I were on, there were four crews and it, our crew emerged as, as being one of the, the breakout teams of people. So they gave, uh, Bruce and Eric Radomski uh, uh, the chance to start developing Batman and they asked me if I would develop uh, a few different things uh, like Gremlins and um, Vacation uh, you know the Chevy Chase movie try to turn those things into uh, to, into to animated series and uh, well they Obviously, they went forward with Batman, and they didn't go forward with the other things. And at one point, Bruce asked me if I would direct on on Batman, but uh, I felt an allegiance to the the uh, the producer that had given me my job on Tiny Toons, and he went on to be the showrunner for Tasmania. And so, um, as wonderful as it would have been to have worked on Batman, I I don't regret having uh, the decision I made because uh, his 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 name is Art Vitello, uh, and Art gave me my first chance to animate. He gave me my first chance to write. Uh, he gave me my first chance to direct. So I I owe him a lot, and and um, you know, as as an amazing a success as as Batman what has been, and how it spawned an entire universe of, of sure. animated cartoons. Um, uh, it was uh, it was a, still a wonderful experience. Do any of those still exist? The vacation uh, pitches or the gremlins? Does any of those <laughs> uh, like drawings or if I, if I um, deep enough on the internet? Uh, I'm not sure if they are. I'm surprised sometimes at what shows up. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, I was, uh, but Joe Dante was, was 
the go-to guy for 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 gremlins. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I had a lot of artwork that went to him to look at. I don't know what survived on the internet, but so, sometimes those those things uh, do pop up. I haven't posted anything. Mm-hmm. I'm always afraid of getting in trouble for posting things I'm not supposed <laughs> to post. So, so uh, I don't think they are. Plus, you don't have room in your house to keep all that. Yeah, and that's the other thing. Is like I every time I move house, I always have bins of drawings I've done from you know the last few years i worked at a studio and then there's that that um uh moment where i have to say do i need to hang on to this anymore <laughs> so i'm moving again uh and i just i just found like i threw out zillions of storyboards from different things that i w- worked on over the years uh, um i just i just i always feel like eh, if i needed if i needed a picture of tigger or Winnie the Pooh or, or, you know, something else I've worked on, I have just drawn another one. So I'm not very precious <laughs> drawings, unfortunately. Awesome. And uh, Keith, did you, did the show, did you like the show? Did you watch the show? Did it influence you? Do you? Uh... Uh, the, the Batman show? Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm yes. sorry, Greg. I... Oh. oh, yeah. I mean, I remember the, more the live, you know, the live action version of more than the, the yeah, but I definitely watched the animated version too. I, I, I mean, I think every male kid was a huge Batman fan. It seemed, seemed like it was on, it was on every day somewhere, either the, either the, you know, Adam West the version or the, or the um, animated version. So. And Shirley Walker, the amazing composer on that was, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, you know, they just collected an am- amazing group of people. Here's another funny coincidence that I think you'll really appreciate. Now, I just remembered this. Um, uh, I used to have a, an actor friend when we're when I was a starving musician and he was a starving actor. Um, and uh, we're both in our early 20s and he was he was um, just frustrated because he couldn't get an agent and without an agent, he couldn't get any parts in movies. And so one day I, I said, you know, what, what are you going to do if this never happens for you? And he said, you know what, Carol O'Connor was 55 when, when uh, he got on the family. And I, if I have to wait that long, I'm going to wait that long. Well, uh, I'm prepared to do it. So two years later, things have gotten even more miserable in the music industry. Uh, but I am, uh, I'm now, uh, there's an art school that opened up just, just up the street from where I live. And Glenn Vilpu, who's the figure drawing guru to the animation industry, is the main instructor there. And I started taking lessons from him. And one day, Glenn looks at my drawings and he said, hey, those are good. You should uh, go get a job in animation. And, I, you know, I had no idea how good you had to be to be a professional artist. And I said, you think so? And he said, yeah, you're as good as those guys. So, so. While I'm mulling this over, I I go to a $2 matinee because that's all I can afford and Back to the Future is playing. And sure enough, my starving actor friend is playing Biff in uh, in, uh, (laughs) Back to the Future. And then to bring this back, uh, so that is one of the things that inspired me. The fact that I saw my friend, hey, he did it. I should give this animation thing a shot. So Biff is partly responsible for me having the courage to to uh, to uh, apply uh, at animation studios. And then to bring the circle around, Tom Wilson, that actor, ended up playing roles in the Batman TV series. Right, right, right. Um, so this would this was mid '80s when they were just uh, hand you get off the plane and they give you a job in animation or uh, in voice or whatever you wanted. Oh yeah, that's a, that's kind of a funny story too. I uh, I I had about three months of life drawing. That's all the lessons I had <laughs> as an artist. But my teacher had filled me with confidence, and and uh, Tom's success had inspired me. There was a there was one three by five card on the bulletin board uh, at the school looking for assistant animators. So I called the number on it and I said, um, hey, I'd like to come in and take your assistant animation test. And they said, do you have any experience? And I said, no. And they said, well, then I hesitate to let you come in. 
but I was just been told that I was good enough. So I said, oh, don't worry, I can draw. And, <laughs> okay. So I went in and I didn't even know enough to put my drawings in a portfolio. It was literally like I had just grabbed a stack of random. It was a bowl people. of drawings. Yeah. Just, just like, <laughs> and, uh, and I dropped them. Yeah. <laughs> I dropped them on her, her desk. And, uh, and she sent me into the next room to do the assistant animation test. And when I came out, she handed me my drawings, now neatly stacked, <laughs> and said, uh, uh, here, uh, they're going to take you over to Gary Hoffman, and he's the head of layout. So I took my drawings over to him, and he looked at them, and he, and he said, um, I want you to take these to uh, Diane Keener. She's the head of character uh, design. So I took the drawings up to her, and she said, hey, well, would would you have time to stick around to do a character design test? And I said, yes. And so I went off and did the character design test. And then everyone seemed happy. Uh, and they gave me my drawings back. And, and, and I waited a week. I never heard anything. I started to wonder if I was mistaken. And then another week, they called me and they said, OK, which job do you want? <laughs> and I said, you want to the most. And they said, <laughs> and I said, I'll take that one. So that's, that's how I got started. <laughs> wow. Yeah, we're just like that. Wow. <clears throat> well, I don't have any, I don't, I don't know what to say to that. That's just, uh, I, I, I mean, I hear a lot of these stories, but I'm always flabbergasted. Um, well, the same kind of thing happened on the music side too. I was doing character designs on, on the Beethoven TV series and I submitted a theme song on spec uh, and the, the, they gave it to uh, Michael Gross and um, Ivan Reitman and then four or five other songwriters submitted songs and they just picked my song. <laughs> so, so I thought that's how you do it. So then I went to work on, on the mask as a character designer and I submitted a theme song on spec and same kind of, exactly the same thing they 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 bought that song and then not not only that but they asked for another song because the mask was uh, a saturday morning show and it was also a syndicated show so they wanted two different theme songs for for the two different packages so uh, and now he tells me that's not how you're supposed to do it no, that, no. that never happened no if you, if you see an advertisement for wanted composer system <laughs> No, that's that's not that. It's like if, if you even get a chance, you get you're making coffee and you're right. Uh, you're right. Not, you're not you're not actually going anywhere. <laughs> but a lucky lucky opportunity, lucky shot, and undeniable talent got you got you to where you are, right? When you were watching those cartoons late on Saturday morning, I used to have to get up early and fight my brother for a good spot on the couch so I could so I have the best seat, and I'd have to also get up a little earlier to go in the kitchen and pour myself a big bowl of cereal. So Greg and Keith, what was your favorite bowl of Saturday morning cereal? I'm Canadian and there's no contest. It's Shreddies. They don't even <laughs> have them. <laughs> oh, I've never heard of that. <laughs> I remember going through account chocolate phase. Anything chocolate was all, I was all over that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Count chocolate, a big fan of that. Uh, get the nice reward at the end with the chocolate milk. Nice little glass, half a <laughs> couple ounces of chocolate milk. But the shreddies is that is that a uh, reference to the damage it does to the inside of your mouth while you eat? It? <laughs> there are your intestines. Right. Is it, where where is the where is the damage on the way in, the way out, or? <laughs> uh, yeah, because it's like uh, down here they're called. Uh, a Chex cereal, uh -huh. that's the closest thing. Oh. And yeah, if you try to eat Chex cereal before the milk is softened, yeah, it'll just uh, <laughs> tear your mouth. So yeah, maybe that's why they come <laughs>